Welcome. Welcome to everyone in the room and welcome to everyone online. I'm Bridget Gilday. Hello, everyone. Um, lovely to see some folks that I do know and great um, that everyone else has come whom I don't know. So I founded this thing called the Curiosity Incubator here at the Intellectual Forum, which essentially looks for new solutions to our most pressing problems and uses the acceleration and incubation methodology from the for-profit universe um, into the for good. So public policy, ideas for good, all of that kind of stuff. And one of the first people whom I called um, when I was starting this uh, idea was Catherine, uh, whom I've known for, we've, we've worked out it's eight and a half years now, isn't it? Which is, doesn't sound that long, but in behavioral science years, it's like dog years, is you know <laughs> almost an entire lifetime. Um, so I will let you introduce yourself, but one of the things that I was incredibly excited about when Eleanor and the team talked to me about exciting speakers in my network was bringing Catherine and her amazing work on the unweirdification of behavioral science here to uh, the UK and to the IF. So Catherine, who are you? <laughs> so um, in the spirit of unconventional evenings, uh, can we have the... Oh yes, Please. I've got the clicker. Yeah, I should yeah. probably do that, shouldn't I? All right. <laughs> we did practice this. We did practice. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, so I'm going to introduce myself with um, this quiz. And um, the idea is, I don't know how many people know the quiz, four pictures, one word. Nobody, really. <laughs> so it's, it's something that I used to play a lot online. And um, yeah, so the, the idea is for you to guess one word uh, connects the four pictures. It's it's a trick question, really. <laughs> <laughs> I failed at this, by the way, so don't feel too bad. It was, it's, it, for people from weird countries, it's incredibly hard. Do you want to yeah. talk us through it? I, I, I wonder what people online yeah, have to point. say. So I, I wonder look. if Gabriel has any feedback, if anybody can guess, because I know that um, there are a number of people joining from different parts of the world. Let's see. Should we ask Gabriel? So we have... Um, we should probably kind of specify at this point that this is a bit of a different talk and we have different quadrant quadrant captains, right? So we have moles within within each of the areas who are going to be working with you. Um, if all the moles, the quadrant captains can raise their hands, right? So these are all folks who've come to the Curiosity Incubator and they're going to be encouraging us, uh, and when I say us, I mean you, to participate um, in the audience pieces. But we also have someone online who's our Zoom captain of the rest of the world. It takes about eight seconds for Gabriel to come on, so if we can tee him up, it'd be really interesting to hear if anybody online has managed to solve the quiz of the four, the four photos, one, one word. I didn't spin it out for eight seconds, that's the problem. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but it's fine. Um, so since it's a trick question anyway, <laughs> so the four pictures, one word, uh, the one word is Plateau State, um, and that's where I'm from. Um, it's in the Middle Belt region of Nigeria. And um, so if you know Plateau State very well, the rocks, the Riom rocks are um, quite significant in the state. Any, anybody that knows those rocks know, so Plateau State has these lovely rock formations everywhere. Um, then the Velang dancers are actually from my mother's place, um, representing diversity. Um, Plateau State is one of the most diverse states in Nigeria. Um, as you know, Nigeria is a very diverse country, but Plateau State has over 50 ethnic groups, and this is just one of them. A source of pride, and as you know, if you follow events in Nigeria, also a source of conflict um, because of inter-ethnic um, conflicts that happen. Then the landscape, it's one of the most beautiful places, really. Um, and beauty in diversity, in conflict, with rich resource, um, suffering from what Nigeria suffers from what a lot of people call the resource course, um, because we do have the natural resources but haven't quite been able to turn it into prosperity for the common good. And then this is my favorite, the Montau man. He represents our Nok culture, Nok civilization and also represents our historical past uh, because he's currently being kept for us in a museum in Scotland. And I would use this point, not that I knew Sunita was coming, to be honest, but I would use this point, you know, as a shout out to Jesus College, you know, for being one of the first institutions in the world to return the Benin bronze, 
you know, um, the return of the stolen artifacts from Nigeria and Jesus College was the first institution in the world to do that. So this is a shout out, <laughs> you know, to, to Jesus College. But I used these pictures, you know, to talk about myself because this, the weave throughout this conversation this evening talks about the personal, how we view ourselves, what informs our lenses, the way that we see the world. And then it also talks about complexity, which is part of what you know, we're trying to unravel with behavioral science. And you know, it, it leads me to where I met Bridget, where I was questioning from my own past, from my own work, um, working in, um, around governance and accountability issues in Nigeria. I used to work with the Open Society Foundations. So I used to give grants to organizations to do work around governance and accountability. And I always had this nagging question of what more can we do to make the government more responsive to citizens? And when I saw um, public policy, applying behavioral insights to public policy, I thought that it was a course I needed to go to. I went there with the intention of, I want to find out what it means you know, to have people-centered policy. And that was where I met Bridget. Should I have actually said that that's how we met because I funded that program? I think I probably should have said that before, shouldn't I? Anyway, yeah. sorry about that. We did practice this, like <laughs> I said. Um, but yeah, one of the things that was amazing about Catherine's work to me is at the time when we were creating this program, um, at Harvard, it was the first practitioner program in behavioral science in the world. Um, and I think what was really interesting about that is Catherine's work and the work that she was doing with the MacArthur Foundation, it really kind of spoke to me about how behavioral science should be changing at the time, which is to move into more complex behaviors, more difficult scenarios. Fast forward eight years, and we're starting to see more of the field kind of join that. So I've had the nod that Gabriel wants to come on. Is that the nod? Yes, fantastic. OK, Gabriel, come and tell us something that we were supposed to hear about five minutes ago that we skipped over. <laughs> Again, it's the eight seconds thing, isn't it? Yeah. You there? No? He's coming on. There we go. Ah. Hello, yeah. everyone. <laughs> Hello. Yes. So, um, so far we've had about 52 people uh, on our online panel um, joining us. And right now I'm still going through all the responses. So again, I, I, I welcome everyone's participation online and I will go ahead and facilitate questions for you. Brilliant. Fantastic. Thanks so much. BI 101. There you go. Behavioral Science 101. Yes, okay. <laughs> I was like, is that a segue? Or? So just before we kind of kick off, I want to have a quick sense check as to who's in the audience, right? So we're going to do some raised hands. We're going to be really old school about this. You know, there's all kinds of technological um, programs you can use to do this, but I like the hands. So just give us a sense of, in terms of sector, right? So people who, are, who work in academia to start off with. Here we are. Yeah, most people. Cool, fantastic. I'd be disappointed if that weren't the case. And then people who work in kind of public policy, the for good universe? Yep, fantastic. Yes, Graham, you've got to put your hand all the way up for that. Yeah, okay, fantastic. Um, business, you know, the kind of for-profit universe. I said that in a really kind of judgmental way, but I didn't mean it that way. Fantastic, excellent. And then kind of A and other, anybody else? Maybe NGOs, maybe other things. Yeah, fantastic. What's your A and other by, in, by out of interest? Because you look not very persuaded by it, so that's interesting. <laughs> Garden designer, fantastic. Behavioral science of garden design, fascinating. Really interesting. No, I'm serious. The built environment is incredibly important in the context of behavioral science. Okay, so one more question before we kick off. So, and in terms of weird versus unweird, in terms of places in the world that we have lived and or worked, um, you know, we're gonna do a quick show of hands. So Europe, I would imagine most of us have lived and or worked in Europe. Yeah, fantastic, okay. North America, yeah, couple. Excellent, good. South America? Yeah, you and me. Okay, fantastic. Um, Africa? Yeah, fabulous, wonderful. Couple of us, great. Um, Australia? Is that, I mean, I would, yeah, okay, some, good, fantastic. And Asia, anybody? I'm going to skip um, Antarctica if that's okay, right? I'm just going to skip that one. And then one more question, who feels themselves to be uh, fairly, well, like, let's say knowledgeable rather than expert in the realm of behavioral science? Or at least know something like, yes, good. I would be very disappointed if that hand didn't. <laughs> Anybody else? Good. Okay. F 
Fabulous, wonderful, fantastic. So we're going to hear super quick from Gabriel about what the rest of the world looks like, right? Because we're, we're a group of people in the room here in a weird country, right? Weird being, by the way, Western, educated, industrialized, rich, democratic, right? So that's how we're weird. And the unweird places are those that are not that. So I'm going to tee up our eight second delay. Oh, he's, uh, he's there. There we go. Gabriel, give us a sense of who's online as well. Okay, uh, can you hear me? Yep. Okay, so, so far our panelists have indicated they are from Nigeria, uh, some from Hawaii in the United States, uh, local, Cambridgeshire, Derby, UK, um, and so, some of the professions that have been um, sharing us what they do is some academics, psychologists, uh, one behavioral scientist, believe it or not, uh, and uh, some people in business. Fantastic, thanks so much. So you'll, you'll notice what we're trying to do is kind of broker the rest of the world, the unworld, uh, the unworld, that too, the unweird with the weird, right? And it was actually quite an interesting design challenge of how to do this um, in a room in Cambridge versus the rest of the world. So we're going to come back to that in a bit. So what is this behavioral stuff that we're talking about? Actually, before I go into that, does someone want to give us a definition of behavioral science? No? I promise I won't be mean about it. Do you want to give us a definition of behavioral? No? OK. No? All right. So this is, this is the kind of working BI 101 that we tend to use. So now that I've created one, you can tell me it's wrong, right? And we, this, is, this was actually taken from the work that we did when we created the Harvard program. Um, and essentially, it's really thinking about how people should behave. So when we're creating policies, in general, we try to kind of assume what a person might or might not do. And it's almost a kind of idealized state, right? Whether it's about ourselves or other people. I like to say, often when you're dealing with policy, people kind of have the sense that citizens are like sims. They're just kind of existing in this world in this kind of stasis until you have a particular policy or a particular thing that you want them to do. And as we know, that's not how any of us lives our lives, but you'd be really surprised, or perhaps you wouldn't be very surprised, the number of times where you're in policy conferences, working with governments around the world, and they're still kind of saying, for example, in the realm of um, you know, financial decision making, well, we need to give people more financial education, and then they'll save for their pensions, when we know for a fact that that's not actually the most effective way of getting, it to do, getting people to do it, right? Um, so I find this really interesting, and one of the things that's really fascinating about it is if we, if we kind of take from behavioral science the idea that we're interested in why people behave in the ways that they do in the real world, in their contexts, one of the questions that we have is, why is behavioral science so weird? Yeah. And so um, just jumping on that, why is behavioral science so weird? I would start with um, this map, but I'll also start with a question that I asked not just once, uh, but a couple of times when I was in that you know, class at um, the program I Harvard. And the question I kept asking, you know, because I came to that class with the idea of what I wanted to get out of it in terms of how behavioral science is applied um, and the people-centered focus. And so I asked, you know, what were the comparative examples about how behavioral science was being applied in other contexts? And examples were given. And the first thing I noticed about the examples were that um, there was a difference. So in the Western context, it was more government driven within government. And then in non-Western context, it was di driven by the multinational organizations. And so when you look at this map, so this map does tell the story about you know, where the behavioral insights and policy institutions are located in the world. But what I see when I look at the map as well is the multinationals in blue. And if you had the map of where a number of them are working, the arrows will be pointing back in to Africa and to, you know, um, the other parts of <laughs> the global south, but Africa is my own, you know, area of interest, and Nigeria as my context that I take um, my brief from, and so this was sort of the representation of what the world, you know, looks like in terms of um, in institutions implementing behavioral science, and then the next um, quote that comes up um, is, you know, just a recent event that was held, and so. As 
Bridget explained, you know, for those who are experts, who are behavioral scientists, you do know that behavioral science sits on like sort of two pillars of um, knowledge, economics and psychology. And, you know, sort of the marriage of the two, you know, gave behavioral economics its name and behavioral science. And so, you know, this question about psychology being weird, um, looking at weird samples, looking at weird populations, you know, looking at weird research in terms of understanding human psychology and now, you know, applying it to the rest of the world was one of the big questions that came up in 2010, um, written by here, people in Cambridge here, that wrote that first um, article and then, yes, um, and then a recent one 10 years later and the picture still looks the same. Now, a follow-up article that was written just recently, and it was still by the psychology um, department here in Cambridge, said, you know what, we've been talking about the issue about diversity, you know, diversity in sampling, diversity in populations, but if you look at it, it goes beyond just diversity. It's also about the assumptions in the field of practice that are focused on one way of looking at things, it's also about the methodologies that are used that are not inclusive. And then it's also about the institutions and the priorities of the institutions are what they're willing to fund. Um, and so you, know, so you have this conversation that has started going on beyond weird um, and we're go beyond diversity. We're still going to come back to that, but I think uh, there's something that Bridget wants to say before we look at what the discourse has been like. So one of the things that we were thinking about when we were creating this is, well, what's the real problem here? What are we really talking about, right? And so one of this is not a having a go, by the way, at one particular person. This is just something that happened recently. So this is a bunch of tweets that Jay Van Bevel, anyone know Jay before I start? Yeah, exactly. So it's not him. I'm not having a go at him personally. But I think what's really interesting about this study, and especially the call for participation in this study, right? if you read it, it tells quite an interesting story about how we currently um, carry out research in the realm of psychology and behavioral science. So essentially, you know, we start with, we've just secured a huge grant to help fund our new study on the impact of social media around the globe. Sounds exciting, right? And it's good to have the non-weird um, piece of it. But I think this tells the story about one particular way of approaching the unweirdification of behavioral science or psychology that doesn't necessarily tell the whole story. So I'll take you through it. So essentially, what he's talking about is creating some data collection around the world. He's trying to get a good sampling of the data collection, right? And you can see here's all the countries in gray over here that he's looking for. What's really interesting is when you look through this, when you look at the criteria of the um, academic collaborators that he's interested, he and his team are interested in working with out of New York University in the States, they have a kind of set of criteria that they're using, and one of the criteria is looking at funding, right? So when you're looking at this kind of project, funding is incredibly important. Just to remind us, this starts with, we've secured a huge grant to help fund our new study, right? And in American terms, huge means huge. <laughs> so if we're talking about quite a lot of money here, right? But then when you kind of click through and you look at what he's looking for, there is some funding um, available for in-country, in-region partners in non-weird contexts. He uses the term Global South. But they're predicating that funding on academic institutions that already have funding that they can contribute to this project, right? Now, that makes sense within the context of American funding uh, approaches. But when you think about it from the perspective of someone from a non-weird country, when what they're trying to do is participate in this kind of knowledge production, as it were, I think we can see there's some problems associated with that. So, like I said, I actually think this is slightly better than the vast majority of the work that happens because he's being um, transparent about it. It's on Twitter, you know, and they're, they're very, much, very much trying to kind of spread the net wide, but the focus is still on data collection, right? As in, we in, New in NYU have created the way that we're going about this, and what we want to do is kind of scale our, uh, our survey and our way of looking at this throughout the world. Right. So again, I think Jay's a nice person. Like I'm not having a go him in particular. It just popped up at twi in Twitter, and I thought this is a really interesting example of some of the things that we're talking about. There's also a reason why I'm going through this, which is I am not an academic, so I'm allowed to say that I think this is, you know, slightly challenging in some ways. 
Um, and what I'll be really interested to hear is more from Catherine about the view from non-weird countries about how we can do this better. So, um, you know, <coughs> going through the literature and looking at what the discourse has been like and how the discourse has been framed, I sort of got, you know, different senses from different parts about what the discourse is saying. So when I looked at general discourse, and as Bridget just explained, what I saw was that, you know, the general discourse was talking about we have to make, you know, our findings more generalizable. Um, we have to expand our geographic, you know, focus. We have to add cultural diversity, you know, to research, and we have to broaden understanding of human behavior be beyond weird. Essentially, we should embrace diversity in the way that, you know, that has been defined. Now, what the interesting thing about what the Global Southern researchers were saying was that this question is really about power imbalance um, between ourselves and our foreign, um, you know, partners, which is characteristic of exploitation. So what I want to do essentially as the researcher is um, you know, get data, you know, that would make my research, you know, more generalizable. Um, and it's, it seems exploitative, you know, to these researchers. And so what, would, what are they asking, essentially? They're as asking for equal partnership. Um, they're asking for resources. They're asking that, it sh that research should not be extractive. And then recently, um, this was... Uh, Re um, article written by Busara Center. They said, think about the research participants, who they are. And so there's different ways, you know, to look at unwedification depending on where you sit, depending on, you know, how you're thinking about, you know, the question and what it means. And for me, I come at it this is very research, you know, focused and specific. But because of my own area of practice, because of my work, you know, as I said initially, from the governance and accountability field, I come from the field of practice. Like, I have been working, you know, with civil society organizations in Nigeria. And so for me, my thinking is coming from the view of practitioners what are practitioners saying? What are the people who are implementing some of these projects in country? You know, what are their views? And interestingly enough, I haven't found their views anywhere. And so it led me to start, you know, asking some of the questions that I'm asking about perceptions and views of other actors, and then about what exactly, you know, do we mean when we say, on wedification and what has power got to do with it. Okay, so now we're going to have a question. Can you hear me? I think I can hear you. Mm -hmm. Okay, never mind. So now we're going to turn it back over to you guys. And essentially in these quadrants, there we go, now I'm back. Um, was that some kind of silencing methodology? <laughs> I feel like maybe that was what's going to happen here. So um, in the quadrant, so you're one quadrant, you're one quadrant, you're one quadrant, and then online is a quadrant. And so our quadrant captains are going to talk to you guys. So we're just going to take a couple of minutes and figure out what unweirdification means to you guys. And I don't know is a, is a viable response for sure, but I'm really interested in from what we've kind of posed so far, what does unweirdification mean to you? So have a quick chat about it, and then the captains are going to feed back to us in probably about 90 seconds, so a very quick chat. I feel like we should have some kind of music for this or something.
No, it's okay, don't worry. Okay, we're gonna start bringing it back. You're incredibly quick. Charlotte, you're not supposed to be talking. You're supposed to have people talk to you. Seriously, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> haven't understood. Okay. Any other thoughts? Okay. I think we're going to stop bringing it back. Yeah? Who wants to go first? Who wants to go first? You want to go first? Okay, go for it, Oshin. I don't... Oh, yeah. <laughs> then I become very loud. So, um, three interesting points um, that I managed to gather, but there's more interesting points that I gathered in the short amount of time we had. Um, one is about um, evidence and data, and then the lack of transparency uh, still with that, and then where data comes from in a context of what do we use data for when we are building a case, mm. um, and how can we uh, change that. But it was an interesting concept around working with um, the groups and how do you empower people, because uh, the equal access or um, accessibility to data is there, but you need to have probably the resources, the allocation of resources, and it may be about the financial allocations to empower. And then how do we balance that? And then how do we build transparency in that? And then an interesting thought up there is, is the context of values and culture and the fact that we need to understand the mindset. Is that the mindset concept that you were focusing on? That mindset people and have, models. and then how yeah. do you... The cognitive structures. And the context, right? Yeah. The, the behavioral context, 100%. Great. Who wants to go second? I realize I looked directly at you when I said that, but that does that's not because I actually thought that that needed to happen. Yeah, yeah. I was like, it's going to be me. It's gonna <laughs> be me. <laughs> yeah, uh, again, really hard to put it down to specific words, but we had some great conversations um, that kind of focused on diversity of approach and kind of broadening kind of horizons and perspectives when we're kind of um, un understanding things. So reaching untouched areas, diversity of approach, uh, broadening perspectives and understanding lived experiences across a larger scale. Um, something that we also, that came up that was really great in this corner here is kind of the ability to challenge is important with onwardification and being able to kind of challenge th those different kind of um, uh, perspectives when you're trying to reach that kind of broad sense. So I think our words are more like broad, diverse, broadening, lived experience, universal. So yeah, we've got quite broad words over here. Fabulous. And points for actually doing the, the actual um, instructions of the exercise, which is words rather than points. So we're, we're doing a little kind of dry run for when we get to questions rather than comments. So we'll find out. Lizzie, what about your quadrant? I don't think your mic is on. On now? Yeah. Yes. Wow. Um, so yeah, so I have I have three psychologists sitting here in front of me. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I think what uh, what we discussed was that originally, uh, when the term was coined, it was it was specifically about the diversity of participants. Um, but we also spoke about div diversity of authors, and then a couple of questions that came up. So yeah, the word diversity again was very strong. Um, a couple of questions that came up that were quite interesting. One is, is unweirdification actually something that is universally um, good or necessary? Like, is the field of experimental psychology relevant everywhere? Um, and then another question that came up was, what's the difference between unweirdification and decolonization of thought? Mm. Yeah, and that came up in the chat as well. So let's hear from Gabriel super quick. Very mm. interested to hear how our conversation in the room chimes or doesn't um, with the rest of the world. Okay, so yes, um, well, 
I just wanted to add also that we have participants uh, also from Madrid, Spain, where I'm based, uh, from Scotland, Romania, and from Guinea. Uh, but with respect to the questions, um, unweirdification, we have quite a range of, of um, responses from the participants online. And these that are the ones that stood up to me. Using participants that are unweird, uh, empowering behavioral science techniques and data collection, uh, research and storytelling, um, changing perspectives, uh, more inputs from Latin America and Africa, uh, rich countries uh, funding poorer ones, more funding to unweird countries, uh, removal of Western bias from behavioral science, and uh, this one came up over again, um, funding and resources. Really interesting. Thanks so much, everyone, and thank you for participating. This is a participatory methodology. Okay, so, oops, there we go. Yeah. So now we're in the meat of it. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so when um, I started this research, I did not set out to do an awareification of behavioral science. What I set out with was a set of questions that I wanted to understand within the context of my country and the problems that we had. And so what the first thing I noticed was discourse, the dominant discourse and the way that those dominant discourses were replicated in the way that conversations about behavioral science was had. And so I started asking myself questions about knowledge, you know, how knowledge is generated, the ways it's disseminated, and then, you know, how does it shape meaning, things that we get to understand about behavioral science, how is it shaped? Now, I, I, I started thinking about this because I reflected on the fact that behavioral science essentially came out of a certain context with a certain purpose to achieve you know, certain goals. One of the things I do in my research is um, I take a historical slice at the evolution of behavioral science. And I'm fascinated by the story you know, of its evolution and how it came about and the kinds of conversations that happened before you know, the nudge unit was set up. And when I look at the reports, like I, I saw one of the reports was done as far back as 2004, and it was talking about personal responsibility and state responsibility. And what it was trying to do was the state of knowledge. What do we know about personal responsibility? What do we know about state responsibility? And even within that report, which was um, carried out by the Prime Minister's Strategy Unit, I hope I, I said that right, you know, what, what essentially they were looking at was what is it, you know, people here in the UK were talking about in terms of what I can take personal responsibility for and what the government needs to do. Why they, they set out to do this was because they're like, government can't do it alone. Implementing public policy is costly. And so how do we strike a balance between what individuals should take responsibility for and what government should take responsibility for? Interestingly enough, within that report, they contrasted that state of individual responsibility versus state responsibility with what was happening in the US and other Scandinavian countries. And there was a difference because in the US, it was more, it showed that the citizens there were more for individual responsibility. And so when you begin to question, you know, look into these discourses, you see that th there is a specific way that these actors were looking at the problems they were trying to solve. And then there's a specific way, there was a deliberateness and an intentionality to it. And so, you know, these were the initial discourses. And so when later on in 2009, when the Mindspace reports came out, when the first behavioral summit was held, there were, it was at the back of a series of kinds of conversations. And interestingly, the 2009 Mindspace report came out just after Nudge was written. And Nudge, you know, the way it spread in the US and then, you know, transfer. So, so you can see that, you know, there, there is, you know, like a state of prepare, preparation, you know, that happened. 
and, came, and it came out of a very specific context. Right? Yes. So this is one of the things that I find most fascinating about how we kind of look at things now. There's a lot of there's a lot of criticism of nudge. There's a lot of criticism of some of the kind of early claims that the behavioral insights team made and others, which I think none of us uh, refutes and we probably shouldn't. But what I really find really fascinating about this, having worked a lot in the States and also in the UK, is even between those two countries, which are ostensibly similar countries, there's often a kind of complete misunderstanding of each other's context. And you saw this in the setup of SBST, which is the social and behavioral sciences team in, uh, in the White House and the Environment Administration. Um, where they kind of copied the number 10 uh, approach without really understanding, I think, on either sides how both governments work quite differently. So what I find really interesting about that, those being the countries that I myself have lived in and am from, if that, my kind of analogy is, if that is such a kind of fundamental misunderstanding of each other's culture, which happens frequently, by the way, um, as I'm sure if anyone knows who's lived in both the States and the UK, um, if that in itself has some really kind of incredibly specific context, both cultural, political, and therefore behavioral, what does that mean when we approach you know, countries and contexts that are so radically different? And so I think it's a really interesting perspective to come at from a spirit of humility, rather, rather than kind of saying, well, we're experts in X, Y, Z. It's much more interesting, I think, and much more truthful from an intellectual perspective to approach it from the spirit of not knowing. And that's definitely how I've approached um, my work, again, as a practitioner in this field. Um, and I find it interesting when people find that a radical or a threatening concept. My own personal reflection. Thanks, thanks, Bridget, for, for that. So, um, yes, context. And I think that now takes me to the next way that I conceptualize power. So, just to be clear. Is that right? Yeah, yeah okay. or maybe you can go back and I make oh. the point. Okay. <laughs> That's the first way I conceptualize power within the unwedification process is power as discourse in terms of what kind of knowledge, what kind of discourses we're having and how it dominates the space and how that impacts on the way, you know, behavioral science is evolving in other parts of the world without really taking into consideration some of these other factors. So the first thing is power's discourse. And I should have prefaced this again with the statement that power itself is very contested. I was sharing with Bridget and others just before the program started that in my department at the Institute of Development Studies at the University of Sussex, myself and my supervisor and a small group of people, you know, who belong to a, 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 the working clusters, you know, power and popular politics, you know, they're called the power people um, because other people within the department, like we have absolutely no idea what they're doing, but you know, they're the power people. So I, I get that, you know, but you, you <coughs> conceptualize power, you know, as it relates to the kinds of questions that you're asking and how we f it helps you to frame, you know, the, um, your research, which is what I'm doing. And then the second way um, I conceptualize power within the unwedification process comes from the application of behavioral um, science in different contexts. And I, I saw this cartoon online and it was just a perfect description, you know, for me about what was happening. So remember what I was saying about the reports that were done, you know, in terms of individual responsibility and state responsibility. And essentially what was happening was that you know, the, the government and the actors within government were trying to think, you know, how do we move people to behave in a certain way, in a way that, you know, helps them to fulfill their aspirations, their goals, that it in itself is debatable. And it's also, you know, quite, uh, not to use this term really, but quite Western focused kind of debate because People start arguing how much of government should be in personal life, how much should you know interference happen. You know, we're, we're not quite there yet. But it looks at what what is it within the context that supports a behavior. We look at free will, and then we look at the cognitive factors, you know, and then we look at the environment, whether the environment is supportive of you know um, um, behavior change or is not. And then we look at the human decision-making and what it means. And what the kind of um, 
point, you know, that I have to illustrate what happens here within in agency and structure and within the context that I come from. I, I look at something like elections, voting, and, you know, what it means for people in different contexts. So in a context where, you know, you have free will, in sort of the weird context, you have free will, and then you have the X factors, you know, that affect your free will to vote, you look at cognitive factors, so people say you look at cognitive burden, how do you make it easy, you know, for people to go to vote, you know, how do you make it attractive, how do you make the messaging timely, and then, you know, you look at the environment, and the environment is supportive of that kind of behavior, and then it's easy for people to make the decision to go vote. Now, well, why what, just interrupt you? I mean, what's interesting about that in the voting analogy is that, of course, what we're doing in the UK at the moment is importing the American voter suppression tactics, which make it as difficult as possible for certain people to vote, yeah. right? So this is what I find really interesting about sometimes about the weird versus unweird debate mm -hmm. is that speaking as someone who spent some time in the States, you know, the, the, the use of making it as difficult as possible for certain populations to vote is actually, you know, kind of evidence-based, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And this kind of goes to the point about data and what data do we use. I always think about it in the kind of logic case of what's the evidence, right? Because when we look at something like, you know, what's happened here with the voter ID thing, right? We haven't actually experienced a general election. Does everyone know about this? People who, live, does, people who know what I'm talking about in terms of voter ID? Yeah, okay, fine. Everyone's looking a bit blank, but maybe that's just me. Um, yeah, so what's interesting about it is we haven't experienced a general election yet. It got passed, and then we hadn't really paid attention to it, right? And there's very good evidence that it will specifically suppress the vote of, of specific people, right? That's evidence-based, isn't it? So one of the things that I think is really interesting about these debates is, yes, except, you know, then you see pockets of different policy that's being made. Um, for political reasons, potentially, I'm not going to go into that, you know, and we haven't actually experienced it yet. And so when we look at this kind of weird, non-weird debate, it's fascinating to me to watch pockets of other kinds of things cropping up that doesn't fit into that paradigm. And I would think that that's the kind of thing that can help us connect in better across different divides, you know, the sense that somehow America is a, a beacon of free will. I mean, I think that's in debatable, we'll put it that way. Uh, it's interesting that you raised this point because as I was having this conversation with other colleagues, you know, from across the world, one thing somebody told me was that, you know, this thing about the weird and unweird debate and then putting power at the center of it actually talks really to un underrepresented groups, marginalized groups. You know, and you know, the person was like, yeah, it's, it is weird and unweird, but it also talks about how even in the application of behavioral science within weird context, there are groups who are marginalized, there are groups who are underrepresented, and there are groups who are captured, you know, just within that whole frame of this is the way that people behave. And for me, I think this, this um, picture illustrates, you know, what really, um, get to the point of what really do we know about human decision making within different contexts. So the first thing that I talk about in terms of power is power's discourse. And then the second thing I talk about power is power in terms of how we understand human decision making and what informs our view about how we understand human decision making based on our experiences, based on our exposure to you know, the kind of literature that we have available based on the kind of knowledge we have or the kind of, um, you know, data that we rely on to say, you know, this is what human decision making is. I remember that through the um, consultancy that I was doing, you know, one of the groups, and I'm going to talk about, you know, the, the, the case study I was working on in a bit, um, and somebody asked me that what, is this like, would you say that this is a standard Nigerian person? And I, 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 it took me time, you know, to think about it. I was like, I really don't know, you know, if you I can them, say. Did, ask, did you ask them what the population of Nigeria was? <laughs> I think that would if have been I a can good say, starting point. <laughs> yeah, if I can say that this is the behavior of an average Nigerian person. Because it is difficult to say, you know, what that is and what that means. And to do that, you know, you need a 
different type you need of 250 million <laughs> different answers yeah to that you question. need a different kind of conversation <laughs> you know you need a different kind of understanding you know and so for me the assumptions that we have about human decision making based on the context based on the environment whether the environment supports you know um, uh, behavior change when, when, when the environment is resistant, you know, to, to behavioral change, you know, is something that we really have to talk about. And so um, going on um, to not the like, Oh, I, I did the wrong thing. <laughs> How do I, uh-oh. Is that not back? The, Sorry, I thought the, I was doing it so smoothly, but yeah, not, I not the screen. So I, I draw inspiration for um, the framework that I decide to to use for for my research from the work of my supervisor, uh, Professor John Gaventa. Um, so he studied his own, you know. Uh, power from a context very similar to Nigeria, and I think that was what you know attracted me to him, and I reached out to him, you know, to ask him to supervise me because, and it was after I, I met him that I realized that he actually grew up in Nigeria, so that was really fascinating. So he did his research in America, in the Appalachian Valley, where the communities, you know, had been affected by mining corporation. And sorry, the mining corporation was the headquarters was here in the UK. But they had been affected, you know, by this mining corporation, and they were helpless in the face of what they were experiencing. And so there were at that time, you know, there were conversations being had about, you know, what it was that made them not to rebel. Why were they not resistant? And explanations where it was cultural that you know they didn't they didn't resist because of cultural factors when he went in and he did his investigation and he did his research he found that you know power actually works in very interesting ways the way that power works you know in invisible ways um, so that it decides exactly what it is that people attribute meaning to the hidden forms of power the way that power decides who actually gets to the decision table, and then the way that power works in visible forms in the visible way that decisions are taken. And he highlights this point because he's like, sometimes we make assumptions about what we know, and I'm saying that because of you know, some of the experience I've had, you know, working with actors within the behavioral science field, the assumptions that we have about human decision making, and I keep coming back to that because it's an important point. So if you look at that illustration that I made about the agency and structure conversation, when we see people not coming out to vote, part of what you know, um, people say, oh, there, you know, there, there's um, status quo bias, there, there's inertia, what do we need to do? We need more knowledge, we need more information, we need more communication. But what you fail to look at is the environment, the context within which they're living, and the historical factors that have led them, you know, not to come out to vote. And so when we, I was working with the partners I was working, I think I was so annoying to them because I kept on asking them, you know, very strange questions, questions that now I know are strange because they're not typical questions that you, you ask, you know, in the, I kept asking them, but how about, you know, um, government action? How about, you know, the fact that government in my own context is not supportive of, doesn't appear to be supportive of, you know, these kinds of behavioral change things that you're talking about. You know, the context is difficult and it is hard for a reason that, you know, when you're living in um, undemocratic societies where the power structures are reliant on a certain way of people acting and behaving, then you have, you know, you, you don't have participation in elections, for instance, because they're not interested in people coming out to vote. And so I kept asking these kinds of questions. And yes, I, I, I didn't, you know, I didn't realize that some of the assumptions that they had, which I now, you know, think I understand is because when you're coming from a different context, the way that you look at the problem is quite different. The way that you interpret what you're seeing is quite different, and so the kind of um, way that you you know you, you view things are quite different. So it, John, you know, from his own experience, you know, formed this um, you know, and other colleagues' ideas came up with this, 
you know, Power Cube framework that looks at the different actors, you know, within the space when you're trying to make change happen. Who are the actors? How do you understand the spaces that you're um, working in? So spaces here, I understand spaces as the context within which you're um, Im implementing, you know, whatever intervention you're implementing. And then, of course, the forms of power that mediate what people's agency looks like you know, within this context. So as you said about, you know, agency and what free will means, when I was looking at this, I, was, I, I thought that, you know, agency within my context looks more like resilience because it's trying to do things in spite of, despite, you know, the context, not because, you know, you have that real free will to choose. Sometimes you actually have a non-choice, you know, in front of you. And so I use this you know, to say when you're thinking about your own reedification process, simply think, ask, you know, who are the actors? What kind of spaces are they involved in? And what kind of knowledge do they rely on? And so with, you know, this is, I, I, I think that I put it that way to make it sort of easy for people to understand or easy for people to remember you know easy attractive social time lane. exactly you so yeah. you look at yourself you know uh, within that space as a researcher as a project designer as a founder you know who am i you know within this space um i think that's a critical point and we're probably gonna have to we're running yeah. out of time here but yeah. um i think i think that's a critical point for us as a community to think about whether you come at it from an academic perspective or a practitioner one or an interested party right a, we have this obsession with, you know, positioning yourself, right, before you're allowed to speak on something for a good reason, you know, because it's about positionality. But often I also think it's about competition, right? Who's allowed to speak on this? Who has expertise? And what I find really fascinating about that is often when we start to kind of position ourselves in that way, we forget the things that we don't know, right? And I'm always fascinated by the really kind of cutting edge, fantastic work that people in the field do it's usually a little bit more intellectually humble than that. It usually comes at this from not, not a case of like, I know all of these things and I'm an expert in it, but actually what is it I don't know? What is it that you can share with me that I know you know that I don't know, mm -hmm. right? And one of the things that I've watched people work on is when you're working with people to understand the barriers to their behaviors, the people who have the most information about what those barriers are it's not me, it's not you, it's not anyone in this room. It's the people who are living those lives. And instead of seeing them as research, I know we say participants now, but I don't really think we've moved on massively from res research subjects. Um, instead of kind of looking at people in that way, I think it would be really interesting to have the curiosity to say, what is it that is being faced in the day-to-day -day lives of people who are you know, having different contexts, suffering different things. And instead of saying, you know, you just need to have more education, which is what we usually do, I think it's much more interesting to think about what it is we don't know. Mm -hmm. And what's fascinating is how often that, I think, doesn't happen. But the power of that concept when we introduce it into the process is really kind of second to none. Um, and we're starting to see some of the rest of our field learning bits of that. Anyway, that's my own soapbox. Yeah. So we're running out of time here. So which yeah. ones do we want to kind of skate through is the question. So I think we can go to um, my reflections because I think I've already You've made kind of talked all about it. We yeah. didn't actually make it through the slides. <laughs> we made all these lovely slides for you guys and now we haven't actually kind of done them. Okay. Do you want to talk about case studies before you go to reflections? Yeah. yeah. So, so essentially the case studies that I have, so um, through my research, um, like I mentioned earlier, Sorry. what I tried to do is I try to get the perception and views and perspectives of the civil society organizations in Nigeria who are you know, working to implement um, interventions addressing corruption you know, using behavioral science techniques. Um, and so they use um, faith-based approaches. They, use, uh, they work with the private sector. And then, um, the so faith-based approaches, let me say one word for each one, faith-based approaches. The assumption is that Nigeria is a highly religious country, but then high levels of corruption, and that you can use you know, religion as a moral voice, you know, to talk to people and then confuse people, you know, sort of closing the values action gap. So you talk to people, you know, using religious texts to get them, you know, to 
stop being corrupt. Then um, private sector Does compliance. That work? I don't Not really. really yet. Yeah. So <laughs> private sector compliance and working with the private sector, a group you know, in Nigeria is designing a tool for self-monitoring for private sector actors. Public sector, um, this case study is working with um, a, a Federal Road Safety Commission in Nigeria to design um, a tool where you can report you know, bribery that happens on the road. And then edutainment, because um, entertainment is you know, big in Nigeria, so using the entertainment industry to sort of design programs where you, know, you can infuse uh, messages around anti-corruption, specifically this project worked around anti-corruption in elections in Nigeria. Now, I want to say, and I want to use this an, as an example to just um, you know, sort of emphasize or sh showcase the points that I was making in terms of difference in the way that we were looking at the problem. So when we were working on this project, you know, with the um, international expert team that we're working with, and, you know, th the whole thing was have an entertainment um, program where you talk about corruption in elections and then get people to call on election day to um, report on corruption that happens. And so we engaged with the electoral body, you know, to say we want to use your phone numbers, you know, to call. And the election body said, yeah, we have a phone number you can call. Um, and immediately we left. I tried the number and it didn't work. So I called the, the person, you know, the contact person, and I said, you know, this number is not working. I said, no, don't worry, it's going to work. And after some time, I called back. I said, it seems like there's a problem with the number. And she said, yeah, we're going to fix it. Uh, we started this process months before the election. Um, and, you know, day before the election, is it going to work? And they're like, oh, yeah, we brought out a short code we're going to use. Like, but this program and the evaluation was set up to use this number. And the people cannot change now. And, you know, there was all sorts of things happening at the background, you know, during this past Nigeria election. And I kept on calling back and forth, calling back and forth, saying, you know, can you get this number working? At the end of the day, the number did not work. Um, and so what the program was able to do was they, the program was just able to evaluate if the message on anti-corruption and awareness raising registered with the participants but wasn't able to measure if people actually take action after listening to the message because the phone number just did not work. And I use this um, to illustrate sort of the point about the assumptions that we make about the context and what works you know, within the context because pe the international experts coming from here just could not figure out why a government number that citizens are supposed to call on election day to report issues just will not work. Um, later on, the person within the department told me, oh, you know what, we had just 20 people that were you know, sort of in the room that were supposed to answer phone calls, and by the first how many minutes, you know, the, the line just couldn't take it and, you know, that load. And so these are the kinds of complexities that we talk about, you know, when we're talking about working in a different context and thinking about how to do things differently. And in my reflection, so maybe we should just go to the reflection now. In my reflect, no, 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 you skipped. Where is it? <laughs> yeah, in my, in, <laughs> in my reflection, what I set out to do in my research is to be reflexive about how I, I go about it. So I'm working with the Nigerian um, partners to think through what does it mean to apply behavioral science within the Nigerian context, given the kinds of issues that you're trying to solve. What, what does it mean for you? What words do you use to describe it? And then I also work with the international expert to say, how did you see this implementation process? Because when I, when I reach out to them to say, I'm going to do this research, they said, oh, that's great. Um, because when we set out you know, to do this, our process is not really fixed on looking at like those kind of practical implementation issues and reflecting with you in terms of that is going to help. So, so far what I've been doing after I've gathered uh, my data and some of the key themes coming out, I go back 
you know, to the international experts to say, I got this, this theme is coming up. What do you think about it? What does it mean for you? I go back to the um, case studies to say, uh, this theme comes up. What do, you, what, what do you understand by it? Then the interesting thing is that also the donor organization who funded it, I'm also reflecting along with them and saying, you know, did you think um, that, you know, this kind of intervention style was going to move the needle in, in this way? And what are your own reflections about it? And so I look at the kind of collaboration that happened with the partners in terms of the unwedification process. This donor gave the funding, um, and I think I have to highlight this because the donor just said, see, the traditional way we've been engaging with anti-corruption, we think that we need a change. We want to reflect and think about doing something different and sort of give a free hand to the international expert to say, take this up, you know, run with it and come up with ideas on how we can do it differently. And the international expert told me that they found that really useful because in other settings, some of the donors will say, we want to measure incentives. You know, look at how incentives work. We want to me measure text messaging, look at how text messaging works, and so they're boxed. And so it's an interesting point for me to make about this whole agency as well, because my assumption when I got into this was that the international expert, they have the expertise and they have sort of the dominance in terms of directing what they want to do. And by the time I was talking with them and reflecting with them, and I found that in certain contexts, their hands are actually, you know, sort of kind of tied because a donor can tell you these are our priorities, this is what you should focus on. And so that dynamic for me is interested, interesting as well in the uh, on wedification process. But well, one point I want to touch on again <laughs> before we leave this point, I know that we're almost, <laughs> we're really out of time, is I've, I've asked the international expert that given the context and given the kinds of problems these organizations you know, wanted to solve, did you have to use this approach? You have an approach that you've already designed. Does that approach fit into every context? Can you have a rethink? Like, do you have to go from A, B, C because you already have this framework of um, targeting, exploring, and solution and trial in place. Are there other ways you could think about doing this differently? And for me, I think it's a high, it's a point to highlight in terms of how we think about this unwedification process going forward. And so I said it is an interrelational thing because it happens within different actors, with different le levels of power and agency, and it's always negotiated. It, it's not static, it's al always negotiated and you have to... So that, yeah. that segues into a really interesting question. I'm just conscious we have six more minutes, so yeah. let's get to a question for the end. Um, so really interesting question from online and then be thinking of your questions. So for the purposes of this, a question is one to two phrases potentially separated by a semicolon followed by a question mark, right? So if you have any statements you'd like to make to us, please come and talk to us afterwards, but a question is a question. We'll see if we can stick to it. So. Um, Peter from online says, one could argue that the present paradox stems from the perception that the global south lacks diligence in research endeavors, and you touched on some of the reasons that that might be the perception, with local researchers di displaying apathy, which I think is quite an interesting point. Um, it seems that research in the, in the West prioritize studying their own environment, expecting solutions to emerge from this, and he describes it as patriotism, which again, I think is a really interesting way of describing it. Um, is this kind of argument valid? You can just say yes or no. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was a really interesting framing of the question. Yeah, it, it is an interesting frame. And I think that in terms of um, what, you know, different contexts and different countries prioritize, I think this plays right into like the kind of dynamic that I talk about in terms of what's the interest, you know, in terms of government actors. And that's, you know, sort of where I look at the opportunities. Because for me, it's an opportunity to think about doing things differently. Um, but if what we're focused on as, you know, some of the actors, you know, coming from um, the global north is in terms of, you know, how we deploy our tools that we've already developed in a different context to say, you know, this, this approach works, you know, from this context to the other without really looking at, you know, the kinds of problems that we're trying to solve, you know, it's, um, it's, it's not going to sort of work out 
um, move the needle very yeah, well. it, it's mm. not going to work out very well for, for, these, um, for, for, for these countries. And so for me, the opportunity to do some, something different is, um, you know, my supervisor, John, talks about um, another kind of power, and he says it's a power for, and that power for is a power to create, to envision a different set of rules. But what I've seen from the, you know, what the research, the data that is showing is that a lot of what people are envisioning is still very focused on, you know, what is replicated in the context. Mm -hmm. And so that, that envisioning power to see can things be done differently, you know, I curtailed. Yeah, mm. it is sort of curtailed. I'm, Whether it I'm is I'm tell you on the, on the yeah. answer too, because <laughs> otherwise we're not. So would anyone like to ask a question from the room? We'll take one. Yep. Well, actually, no, sorry. We're going to come to you later, because I have a rule, which is always go to a woman first. Sorry about that. Anybody else want to ask a question, specifically someone who presents as a woman in this context? We're going to wait until we get one. So anybody? <laughs> Yes, thank you. <laughs> Hi, it's really, really interesting talk. Um, I work in quite different settings. So I work with nonprofits in England. So I'm kind of strict, you know, the same idea, but in the English English context. Mm -hmm. um, and I, well, that's why I'm kind of thinking about. But could you, could you, is this, is this the same principles? Principles. If it's if it's England, if it's Cambridge, or yeah. Yeah. if it's across the the globe, I mean, yeah. Well, I think that's a really interesting question, and I think that the power dialectic is, you know, what's interesting about this power cube is that it was created in the context of international development, but this series of questions that we ask ourselves about why we're designing what intervention for what reason. I think is pretty universal or should be universal. And potentially those of us who work in the domestic context in the UK should ask ourselves more of these questions. I don't know if you have a reflection. Speak to Cambridgeshire. <laughs> what, what do you think about Cambridgeshire? <laughs> yeah, so, um, so like you said, this was designed out of a different kind of tradition. And when, you know, the first thing I, I was tr struck by when I came into academic research was this whole thing about paradigms and everybody being so protective of their paradigm. And you know, how, you know, looking at how things connect. Um, we, we talk about this, you know, being multidisciplinary, we want to find out what different people are thinking, you know, but then how, how do we shift, you know, the views that we have and, you know, translate the kind of knowledge we have across context across disciplines and how it happens in practice I think is really important. I do think that you know this analysis does cut across and apply um, everywhere like Sorry, I realized I didn't rephrase your question for people at home which was how does this apply in the context of you know local English um, issues so we're almost at time we probably do we have time for one more Eleanor are we allowed to go on for another okay yes <laughs> I'm so sorry yes we'll come to you now <laughs> it's just a rule I have about social norming. <laughs> Yes, I'm sorry to be an older white male. <laughs> your your um, point of view is still valid. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, I was wondering whether you'd come across the term epistemologically privileged, because it seems to me that that's a very useful term mm. in the context of what you're talking about. Yeah. Um, I think if, if you can say it 10 times fast, we'll answer the question, don't you think? Epistemologically. Anyway, <laughs> yeah, that's what I think every time someone says epistemology. Privileged, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so you know, just to explain briefly um, you know the idea if you're a, a, a politician making um, policy about uh, benefits or, uh, or whatever then you're not epistemologically privileged because you know nothing about it if you're a poor person you are privileged because you know all about what it's like to be in that situation um, uh, and it's a useful term because um, it shifts the power by calling it privilege, it uh, implies that you know something that somebody else doesn't. And uh, yeah, so I just wondered whether you you were familiar with it and whether you use that in your, in your thinking. 
So the one of the first things, like I said, when I was uh, when I started my research is you know my int introduction to research paradigms, and I remember that after you know I, I was working with my supervisors for some time and um, I attended a, a pro program, and I came back and I was telling them. I have no idea what I'm doing um, because I have not operationalized this concept. And then they said, where, where did you get the term operationalized from? I said, from this program that I just attended. And you know, they're like, oh no, but you are, you know, from all the questions and what you're telling us, you know, you're coming at this from a social constructivist, you know, view, not from a positivist, you know, stance. And I was like, I just want to find answers. I don't really, you know, I don't really care where the answers come from. But I found that, you know, it is important for some people, you know, how the knowledge is generated and, you know, where, which worldview informs, you know, the knowledge and who, you know, can say, you know, they have knowledge. I do use a social constructivist lens because I want to know how words are socially embedded within the context. So maybe I privilege the views of the people in the context because I want their voices to be heard. Um, but yes, I do not also discount like the other voices because as I was telling um, some you know, people just before the program that I'm going to interview a lot of the international experts as well, because I think that their own views would help to balance the views, you know, of the people on the ground that I'm, I'm interviewing. So, yeah, I think I have thought about, you know, um, my own epistemology. Um, I don't know if that sort of answers your question, but so, <laughs> yeah. I really like the term, though. I'm going to steal that. Um, <laughs> So one question that I was really interested in because it actually showed that perhaps we didn't we didn't uh, do as good a job of explaining what we were doing as we should have done, um, which is Kathy was saying, why are we using the government's definition of behavioral science well, uh, elsewhere in, in the university world, but I think you also mean in practitioner world as well, anthropology and sociology and psychology are considered to be behavioral science. I mean, my reading of that was, it, we were very much talking about where this came from, right, and the original kind of, original flavor of behavioral science. And I think the intention was to set up how it kind of came to be in a governmental sense as the origin story against which we now see more productive complexity happening. So apologies to Kathy if that wasn't clear. Um, but it's a really interesting challenge because, of course, you know, who gets to decide what these terms mean and who gets to decide how we use them is a, is a critical um, thing. Can I add something yeah, to that? Yeah, Because it. I think we, it we also... We do need to wrap up, though, okay. so this is... It, <laughs> so, so maybe this is a final point to me. It also speaks about this whole... Um, the multidisciplinary view. Mm. Um, I was listening in on a conversation that was being had, you know, about behavioral science and using behavioral science to address questions of um, racism in the US. And part of what, you know, the person was saying was that, you know, we should focus more, you know, on participatory approaches and then, you know, using, you know, terms um, that people within other disciplines, you know, were quite familiar with. And somebody who was working around health, you know, said, oh, but these are things that we have been doing. Um, you know, maybe we should have a conversation. And so it, it is a multidisciplinary field that privileges certain forms of knowledge. And I think the more we're getting into this space of complexity, addressing more complex problems with behavioral science, addressing more systemic questions, we're going to find that the discipline would have to open itself up, you know, to other views, like the ones within development studies and theories of power to make it more grounded in people's realities. And so maybe that would be my final pitch, actually, in terms of, you know, how this um, unwedification process happens, you know, going forward, um, the way that the field opens itself up, you know, to, to other voices, and, you know, the way that it looks, you know, within itself, within the powers that, you know, the people within the field have, how they question their own assumptions, um, how they define the problems, and how they think about, you know, engaging collaboratively, you know, with actors across Global South, Global North, within different disciplines, 
um, on, on on the privileged, marginalized group, people that you know we need to do just hear their voices as well. Fantastic. Well, we've we've only gone six minutes over, which I think so is sorry. pretty good, actually. <laughs> right? Pretty good. Well, thank you so much, Catherine, and thank you to everyone who's participated. We're going to stick around for a little bit, so if you want to come and talk to us, please do. Um, but thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much to the audience online. Where's the red camera? There we go. Thank you so much for being here. And I'm um, really interested to see where we go next in the field of both on weirdification, well, three of them, really, on weirdification, power, and behavioral science, and all together, one field. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs>